Support for I Hero Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing. With the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. By the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 255, Sherlock Holmes in the Public Domain. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. A podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello and welcome to this very special episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast about Sherlock Holmes, where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And Bert Wolder's muted. Hang on. There we go. And I'm still muted. No, you're not. You're no, Bert Wolder. Well, uh, this is being done live via the magic of the interwebs. We're broadcasting it on our Patreon uh, channel via YouTube Live. So if you are a Patreon supporter, you are watching this live. And we are taking comments either there on Patreon or on YouTube Live. And we will ask your participation. And quite frankly, if there are any patrons who would actually like to join us on camera, we have a few more seats available. So if you want to jump on camera and dialogue with our guests, we will encourage that later on in the show. Um, so this episode, when it actually goes on to our podcast feed, you can find the show notes for it at ihose.co slash ihose255. That'll take you directly to the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere website. You can find all the links we're going to talk about today, and there will be many. I'm not going to try and keep up with them live and post them here in the video because, well, I'm just not that talented as Bert can uh, witness. <laughs> However, um, they will be available for all of our listeners to check out in the show notes afterwards. This is the final episode of season 16 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. I've been doing the show since 2007. And, um, well, I don't think we have any plans to discontinue the show, uh, to my knowledge, Bert. We're just, we're just getting it right. We're so close. So close. We're, we're fine-tuning it as we go along. You know, I listened to uh, an old episode, which we will refer to as we introduce our guests here. Um, and, boy, were we horrible. <laughs> it was oh. completely amateur. Well, you know, those old episodes are all in black and white. And so when you take a kinescope of these podcasts and replay it, you have to adapt it, actually, is what you have to do. I, I understand. Um, and, and I am more than willing to, uh, to try that. So um, I well, find if I listen to them as 45 RPM records, because you have a stack and then you, you, know, you can go through six or seven of them, then it's not so bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, then let's let's do this. Then let's uh, talk about exactly what it is, why it is that we're here. Um, we're here to talk about, um, gosh, Sherlock Holmes in the public domain. I think that's the, what the title has uh, intimated. Well, what does that mean? 
Yeah, what does that mean? Well, we shouldn't be asking each other about that. We should be introducing our guests and asking them about that. Well, public domain is sort of like using public <laughs> restrooms. You know, anything anything can happen. And friends, that's the exciting part about this show. Well, and I think it's really important to remember that if you are using characters or stories in the public domain, please wash your hands out. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't know who's touched that before. Yes. Well, uh, that that is just it. All of the Sherlock Holmes stories as of January 1st, 2023 will finally be in the public domain. Now, there's a long history here that goes into talking about what got us here, why it took so long and the struggles along the way. So we have three distinguished panelists who will join us, all are members of the Baker Street Irregulars, and uh, they have all been on the show before, so they are no stranger to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere or to our listeners. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot and do a live, unscripted biography read here of our guests. Our first guest is probably our longest time guest. It is none other than Les Klinger, invested in the Baker Street Irregulars in 1999 as the Abbey Grange. Les is a lawyer by trade, but he is an annotator by hobby. We know him from the annotated Dracula, the annotated Frankenstein, most recently the annotated Jekyll and Hyde, and of course, the new annotated Sherlock Holmes. He's been with us before on episodes 31, 32, 105, and 155. Les, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, it's great to be here. Our next guest, who has been here on um, almost as many episodes as Les, or I, I, actually, I think equally as many, is none other than Ashley Polisek. Ashley was invested in the Baker Street Irregulars in 2021 as single stick and has her PhD in adaptation studies, specifically looking at Sherlock Holmes. Ashley is now the executive director of the Ken Ludwig Company. Ashley, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thanks very much. Now, Ashley was with us on episodes 109, 143, where we talked about Woodhouse together, 177, and 212. And again, don't feel like you have to keep up with all of these episodes, folks. We'll put them in the show notes so you can go back and listen to your heart's content. And our final guest, who is probably one of my longest Sherlockian friends, is Betsy Rosenblatt. Now, Betsy has the added uh, bragging rights of being a Sherlockian since birth. <laughs> Both her mom and dad, who were with us on episode 103, Al and Julie Rosenblatt, uh, have been longtime Sherlockians, and therefore... Betsy's had it in her blood, and art in the blood is liable to take the strangest of forms. And in this case, it not only took the form of Lucy Ferrier as uh, invested in the Baker Street Irregulars, but also as a professor of law, most specifically intellectual property. And Betsy was with us with Les on our very special Free Sherlock episode, which happened in, gosh, 2013. December 30th, 2013 was that episode. So, Betsy, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, um, this is grand. I mean, having all four of you together here to discuss with us uh, what's going on, I do want to just lay down some uh, some ground rules. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, uh, navigate uh, heads and talking heads from here and there. But um, if you do have something you'd like to contribute, and I'm not, I don't see you or whatever. Just drop a, a, a comment in the, uh, in the private chat that is for our guests. For our listeners and our, our viewers, uh, feel free to drop comments in our YouTube link or in our uh, Patreon post. We'll be scanning those for your comments. And if you'd like to join us on camera, simply let us know in those comments, and I'll send you the link to join us as well. So, I've been talking way too much here, so I'm going to turn it over to somebody else who likes talking, and that is Bert Wolder. <laughs> well, and all I'm going to do is get right to the heart of things and ask Betsy, Betsy Rosenblatt, what's all this about public domain? How does one define the public domain? Well, the public domain is one of those words that gets 
uh, tossed around by the public in a in a sort of a sloppy way, which is true of a lot of legal words. Um, and so I want to give a kind of lawyerly definition of what public domain is. Uh, there are a couple of areas of intellectual property law. Actually, there, there are several, but there are a couple that are relevant here. One is copyright law. Copyright protects works of authorship for uh, for new works for the life of the author plus 70 years or for corporate works, 95 or 120 years, depending on various factors. Um, and then there's trademark law, which is about shopping. Trademark is about brand names and logos and that sort of thing. Uh, what we're dealing with here in this episode is copyright law. And copyright law, back when the canon was written, lasted not based on the death of the author, but based on a set amount of time after copyright was renewed. And uh, the, the, the way that the canon has, uh, has evolved, the very last U.S. copyrights in the last published of the canonical stories is now no longer owned as a copyright matter by anyone. And that means it's in the public domain, which means that using those stories is not and cannot constitute copyright infringement. Interesting. So now just for the sake of our listeners here, well, and for me, who's notoriously ignorant, um, one can presume that this applies to the United States only, as you just said. So in the UK, have the cases of Sherlock Holmes been free from copyright for a while? Or what's the story in other countries? They have, yes. So uh, UK copyright in the canon expired earlier than US copyright. Um, and in fact, uh, copyright worldwide expired earlier than US copyright. The, the US copyright in the canonical stories has been the last to expire. So we've we've now hit the point where the canon is free from copyright globally. Uh, and that's a, an exciting moment. When I say now, by the way, I mean a few days from now. This all happens on January 1st. So, uh, you know, do not publish your major Sherlock Holmes opus today. Wait a few days. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, at that point, it will be free from copyright. There are plenty of copyrighted things involving Sherlock Holmes, including BBC Sherlock and the Warner Brothers short Sherlock movies, which are still under copyright uh, and will be for a very, very long time to come. And there's still trademark law to consider uh, when we think about uh, intellectual property and, uh, and Sherlock Holmes. But now we are in the global copyright-free zone. And and for our and for our and for our listeners, just just sir, one more point there. So now that we're in this copyright free zone, what does that mean? One can do that one couldn't do before. Uh, I would categorize that in two ways. One is uh, you could now republish the canon, the entire canon. Uh, this this thing, <laughs> you can now republish that verbatim uh, without having to get permission from anybody. Uh, you can also adapt it into new works without having to get uh, permission from anybody, but with various kinds of uh, buts and ifs and ands and maybes that lawyers will tell you all about, right? So the one thing that you can definitely do is just republish it as is. The other thing you can do is uh, whatever you want without fear of being sued for copyright infringement by the Conan Doyle estate. That is... Um, the 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 other way to put it um so it does not mean that you're you there aren't other reasons that one might be afraid of the conan doyle estate lit limited litigation strategies but at least they can't sue you for copyright infringement anymore 
Scott, you're muted. Scott, you're muted. This seems like the perfect opportunity then to bring in Les Klinger, who has gone head to head with the Conan Doyle estate. Uh, Les, why don't you take us back to those heady days of <laughs> oh, 2011 oh, to 2013 the, or so? Happy right, memories. the days of yesteryear. Happy well, memories. first of all, I, I want to remind people that the free Sher, free hyphen Sherlock um, website is still up. So for those who want to um, indulge I've got, in it, I've got it here in our show notes and uh, have a banner there that will give people access to not only the uh, the website that you're talking about, but the episode that you and Betsy were on with us before. Right. ihose.co slash free Sherlock, all right. lowercase. So the website has on it um, links and, and copies of all of the court opinions. So to remind everybody what happened, um, in 2012, uh, Lori King and I uh, had put together an anthology called In the Company of Sherlock Holmes. Actually, I'm sorry, I should go back even farther. Um, in about 2010, we put together an anthology called A Study in Sherlock um, that was eventually that was published by Random House. Now, along the way, um, Random House received a letter from uh, the Conan Doyle State Limited, which is, uh, as has been mentioned, the company that owned um, the copyrights. This was a company controlled by <clears throat> the collateral heirs of, of uh, Sir Arthur. Um, and uh, that company asserted to Random House that the book, A Study in Sherlock, could not be published without their permission because it contained stories using the character of Sherlock Holmes. These were all new stories. They were not, um, as Betsy has suggested, uh, republications of the canon. They were new stories involving Sherlock Holmes or Sherlockian-like characters. Um, Random House went ahead and paid the estate $5,000, as I understand it, uh, for a license uh, for that book. This was not uh, with the consent of Lori uh, or me. Um, they didn't consult with us. They they excused themselves for doing that on the basis that it would cost more than five thousand dollars to even talk to their lawyers about responding to the uh, Conan Doyle estate. Um, two years later, we had gone to a, a smaller press, um, Pegasus Books, about publishing another anthology like that one using the characters um, from the canon, and. Um, we were in the process, the book was done. It was in the process of being printed when again, the Conan Doyle State Limited reached out to Pegasus and said, uh, you can't do this. Klinger and King forgot to tell you that they had licensed uh, the characters for the first book, but they didn't license them with the second book. Uh, and you can't do this. If you try and do this, we will block distribution of the book. Um, we'll contact Amazon who will take down the book etc. And the publisher said to us, I, I can't afford to do this. Um, you know, I can't print a book and not have it sell. Uh, what are you guys going to do about it? And Lori and I talked about it and we consulted with uh, Jonathan Kirsch, my lawyer at the time, um, and said, well, it's easy. We're just going to bring a lawsuit. Um, and it'll be a really slick case, meaning we won't have any discovery or anything like that. We're going to sue for declaratory relief. We're going to file in the Northern District of Illinois because that's where the estate has an office, that being Lellenberg, John Lellenberg's home, I think. Uh, and uh, we'll get this over with quickly. So fools that we were, that's exactly what we did. We filed a, a federal case. Um, the, to our surprise, the estate did not respond. Um, they defaulted. They, they didn't answer the complaint. Uh, and of course the court ruled in our favor. We at that point said, well, we need an opinion. We don't want to just win. You know, we need an opinion so they don't do this again. And the court agreed. Uh, and at that point the estate actually appeared and asked to have the default set aside, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they filed a response to the paper. 
um, and the court issued um, a, a, an opinion uh, in our favor saying that um, we could use the character elements that did not appear exclusively in the copyrighted stories. At that point in time, there were 10 stories remaining in copyright. Um, the estate appealed. It went to the Seventh Circuit. Uh, there was oral argument in Chicago. Um, and I think there's a transcript that, no, there's actually a recording of the oral argument linked on the website. Um, uh, it's quite entertaining. Uh, Judge Richard Kozner, who is probably the world's leading expert on copyright, um, was the lead judge in the case and inter in, interrogated the estate's attorneys at great length, gave our attorney only a very short amount of time to speak because he didn't need the ear vote. Uh, and the, sec the Seventh Circuit ruled in our favor. Um, now, now, uh, Les, I, I want to interject here because please. Judge Posner's uh, remarks, uh, he's, he's a salty individual to begin with. Yes. And he did not really take kindly to uh, this business model, shall we say. He said, the, the, and this is a quote from his, uh, his decision, the Doyle Estates business strategy is plain. Charge a modest license fee for which there is no legal basis in the hope that the rational writer or publisher asked for the fee will pay it rather than incur a greater cost in legal expenses in challenging the legality of the demand. The strategy had worked with Random House. Pegasus was ready to knuckle under. Only Klinger, so far as we know, resisted. In effect, he was a private attorney general combating a disreputable business practice, a form of extortion. And he's seeking by the present motion not to obtain a reward, but merely to avoid a loss. Well, unless I think what ended up happening with this decision, and then I think what you're going to tell us next, is we were all the recipients of the reward, thanks to your, uh, your, your lawsuit. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, we were very happy with the opinion. Um, the estate was not, of course. Um, they filed a motion uh, to have the case heard by the Supreme Court. The uh, Supreme Court denied certiorari, meaning that they declined to hear the case, and, and that was the end of it. But we get to say it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the best part of this was that uh, we were awarded fees. Um, and so uh, we were actually very generously supported by, uh, I mean, Lori and I incurred some expense, um, and uh, the Baker Street Regulars actually contributed some funds to support the case. Um, but uh, we were very fortunate. We had no idea that this case was going to turn out to be anything like uh, it, it did, take as long, cost as much, et cetera. But um, in the end, uh, we prevailed. Um, now, the result of that was, as I said, that um, there was a very clear line drawn that so long as you only used character elements that uh, did, did not appear exclusively in the copyrighted stories, you could use the characters. Um, you could certainly use their names. Um, you could use much about them. I mean, there's virtually nothing that at that point in time was only in the 10 remaining stories, which was the case book and a few other stories. Um, so subsequently, of course, the clock has ticked. I thought that countdown at the beginning, Scott, was the number of cases remaining in copyright. <laughs> Starting at 60, counting down to zero. I know. Well, it you know, it doesn't seem it's like it's all that long ago that we were uh we were just hoping for the day that it, it would eventually come that all the stories would be in the public domain. And it seemed like so far off. You know, we're talking about you know, about a decade ago or so. There were still 10 stories uh in the uh, it, that were not in public domain. Um, and they, they actually subsequently entered public domain on January 1st of 2020, 2022, and soon to be 2023. The last two that will enter public domain in 2023 uh, include uh, The Veiled Lodger and Shoscombe Old Place. And, and that'll do it. That's the full case book that will now be 
uh, joining the rest, the, his last bow, the Valley of Fear, uh, the return of Sherlock Holmes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this backwards, so I'm you know, from memory. Uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, the, uh, the Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, a si The Sign of Four, and A Study in Scarlet. I think I got all of them. The, the interesting, I mean, one of the more amusing parts of this is how creative the estate has attempted to be here. Uh, the uh, dispute, the last dispute involved the first of the Enola Holmes films, um, on which I was a technical advisor. And the estate attempted to argue in, in their um, pleadings that uh, the character element that we were violating in that film was warmth. Uh, <laughs> emotion. You know, liking people, uh, and that Sherlock Holmes had never displayed those characteristics in any story up until uh, the case book. And, uh, of course, it was ridiculous, but uh, they continued to try and press it, uh, their theory, and uh, that one was pretty much sort of laughed out of court. Um, but uh, we should talk about trademark. And um, yes, what's left to fight about there? Well, I do. I want to mention a couple of uh, viewer comments that have come in. Ed Pettit says, I was surprised the estate continued to take action <laughs> on further Sherlockian projects like Mr. Holmes and Enola Holmes, doing exactly what they were warned, <laughs> warned against by the ruling. Um, and, so, and fighting our case. Right. In, in, right. In, in their pleadings in both of those cases, they cited <laughs> well, they limited and said, congratulations, you've shot yourself in the foot. Well, <laughs> they, they tried to argue, hey, you guys are using character elements that appear exclusively in the copyrighted stories. Well, they didn't do their homework. I mean, they did a very poor job of research on both of those. The idea <laughs> they tried to stress, for example, that the whole subject of retirement um, was only covered uh, in, in the case book. And we said, nonsense. I mean, his last bow was clearly already in the public domain. Um, yeah. Well, and uh, I do want to acknowledge another comment from Eric Deckers, who is looking at the humanitarian side <laughs> of this, really. He says, <laughs> he says, so does this mean the Conan Doyle estate is going to go hungry? Are we the bad guys now? So well, what's no. Their, what's their business model now? No, no, no. Look, every folks, every time you buy, a container of Conan Doyle mustache wax. <laughs> you are contributing to the health of a group of directors who are huddled around their conference table in London, only looking for warmth, which Sherlock Holmes actually developed around 1925. <laughs> Go for it, Bert. No. Friends, do you need Sherlock Holmes brand <laughs> products? <laughs> Well, no, um, well, we, we need to talk about trademark because yes. this will continue to be a source of revenue for the Conan Doyle Estate Limited. Um, Betsy is the expert on this. I, I will say that there have already been some efforts by the estate to, to mark out trademark. Um, yeah. They filed an application to trademark the name Sherlock Holmes in the category. Now, you know, Betsy, why don't you explain about categories too? But uh, and, and then we'll get to what happened when they filed. So, uh, so yeah, I I, um, I I think I can address both the question of whether uh, we're the bad guys now and trademark in uh, in over overlapping answers. Um, so uh, don't don't worry unless you had if you had any concern that that now possibly the uh, the current oil estate limited was going to go hungry and have to huddle around uh, their their meager coals. Um, don't worry, they still have an aggressive and overly aggressive business model uh, that they can rely on if they wish to. Um, and, uh, and that is a trademark uh, business model. The other thing, of course, is, uh, you know, to, to be more serious than the question merited, uh, we were never the bad guys. Um, because they were always overreaching. But uh, let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about trademark. So, trademark law, as I mentioned at the beginning, is about shopping. It's about brand names and logos and things like that. And there have actually been a number of companies that have claimed 
uh, trademark ownership in various things about Sherlock Holmes. Uh, trademark law has uh, an uncomfortable relationship with copyright and has long been an approach that copyright holders have used to uh, to seek to extend what copyright law does or would do outside the boundaries of uh, copyright law, both practically and temporally. Uh, so what copyright law does is prevents copying and adaptation and, uh, and the, the creation of, of derivative works. That's quite different from what trademark law is supposed to do, which is to prevent consumer confusion. So if you own a trademark, you don't actually own the words of the trademark. Let's say your trademark is Nike. You don't own the word Nike. What you own is the connection between that word and a particular kind of goods or services. For Nike, that would be sportswear, athletic goods, and that sort of thing. Uh, so copyright holders have claimed, and the Conan Doyle estate was uh, by no means in the vanguard of doing this. Uh, that's not true. Conan Doyle estate was absolutely in the vanguard of doing this. Um, they did it uh, going back uh, into the last century. The first lawsuit over Sherlock Holmes and intellectual property actually was a quasi-trademark case uh, rather than a copyright case. But uh, that wasn't brought by the Conan Doyle estate because they didn't exist at the time. Uh, in any case, uh, the idea that copyright holders, including but not limited to the Conan Doyle estate, have advanced is that people associate the word Sherlock Holmes or the words Dr. Watson or the words Baker Street or the image of the number 221 or the image of the deer stalker or the calabash pipe, which they had nothing to do with even creating, but that they associate these things with the Conan and Doyle Estate Limited. Now, of course, people don't associate those things with that source. They associate them with the character of Sherlock Holmes, who's fictional. Uh, but uh, this is a, a strategy that copyright holders have used to say, well, consumers might believe that if you make Sherlock Holmes mustache wax, the people, the consumers will think that that is somehow endorsed by or associated with or otherwise originates from the Conan Doyle Estate Limited or the Sherlock Holmes Memorabilia Company, which is another claimant of, uh, of trademark rights, uh, or various other uh, uh, claimants of trademark rights, including Apple, which owns uh, the word Sherlock in connection with, uh, with search engines, and various other things, right? So. Uh, trademark law has long been a way that copyright holders can say, we're not concerned with, uh, with copyright anymore. We're concerned with trademark. Disney has been really at the forefront of this. They sort of gave up copyright and, uh, in they, they gave out, sorry, they gave up the search for eternal copyright in Mickey Mouse because they understood that what they actually have is eternal trademark in Mickey Mouse. And that's what they really wanted all along. We uh, just got a, a breaking news update from the New York times in the last half hour. Uh, it reads the earliest version of Mickey Mouse from steamboat. Willie will soon lose copyright protection. How will Disney respond? Well, they'll use trademark law. And, uh, and the issue here is that uh, Disney owns the the mark of the sort of logo of Mickey Mouse for a great many categories of goods. It, um, you know, not just comic strips, but also plush toys and um, you know, hats with uh, with with ears on them and things like that. Uh, so but the, the way this works is, again, you don't own the word. What you own is the connection between that word and a particular category of goods, a particular class of goods. 
What the Conan Doyle Estate Limited did was they registered the words Sherlock Holmes and various other things in connection with the class of goods, detective fiction. Um, what that means is that it's not just a matter of people making pins with the uh, with the what is we would associate with a uh, you know a, a, a the look of Sherlock Holmes, but also the idea that uh, if you have a Sherlock Holmes story, people will think that that's somehow branded as detective fiction in such a way that people would assume it's somehow associated with them as uh, the source. This, by the way, is uh, not how trademark law works or how trademark law should work. Uh, I've written about this extensively in my sort of academic uh, career, but it is absolutely how cease and desist letters work. Um, right. And so when we think about this business model of hoping that the rational person just pays, uh, that's what happens with this. And uh, I, I'll note that I have uh, litigated very similar trademark issues on behalf of fan clubs uh, against Warner Brothers. And um, uh, Warner Brothers is even more litigious than the Conan Doyle Estate Limited. So if we're concerned about someone wow. possibly owning the word Sherlock Holmes, Warner Brothers might think they do. Um, and, uh, and that's a, a concern. That very much so. I mean, here, Betsy, I thought I was going to have a problem uh, with with dual claims on my deer stalker with Mickey ears, which I do have, by the way. Um, but now we've got Warner Brothers in the mix, of course, from the Robert Downey Jr. films. Uh, this really does get complex. And and Les, I want to bring you back in. And Ashley, I know you've been waiting patiently. We're going to get to you in a moment. Don't worry. Um, have, a, have a few drinks while you're waiting for us. But um, let's bring Les back in because, Les, you were a consultant to the Warner Brothers uh, Sherlock Holmes movies. Um, how Did you have any... Um, a sense as to how the copyright or trademark issues were being navigated with that series? Yes. Um, they paid. Uh, they licensed the films because those films had budgets of $150 million and um, it, this was jump change. Uh, they didn't feel that it was uh, worth uh, litigating. And frankly, I suspect that they weren't sure which way they wanted to come out on the outcome. Um, I think that they would like to have seen um, us lose in, in the in the copyright case. Uh, but I want to get back to uh, the trademarks because Betsy said something. I think she was joking when she said trademark for books. Um, no, the, the estate did apply. Joking. The estate did apply for a trademark in the category of books. Yeah, we opposed it. They withdrew yeah. the application. They yeah. don't have a trademark for books. They tried to register a mark for books, but they did not pursue it. Uh, the minute that Lori and I filed a letter of opposition, uh, they backed down and they withdrew their application and um, settled that matter. Let me put it that way with regard to fees. Uh, don't, they still have, don't they still have detective fiction, though, and not books? Or am I, am I remembering incorrectly? I think you were remembering incorrectly. There are trademarks for video games, et cetera, but there are no. Uh, and the argument was you can't trademark. You, you know, you just lost that the books are in the public domain. So, you know, you can't uh, you can't trademark it for the category now and sort of nail it down again that way. It doesn't work. Uh, if the name is in the public domain, the name's in the public domain. At least in books. That was our argument. Well, that makes great sense. And so I don't. I mean, uh, Betsy, unless I'm, I, you know, they did file an application. We have a we have a watch um, right. uh, uh, on trademarks, and uh, when I say we, Lori and I, and our lawyer Jonathan Kirsch has been watching this. And I believe that when they filed, we immediately responded. Um, we filed opposition, and they withdrew it. So, excellent. Well, now making, let's making talk progress. Also, though, Betsy, could you explain? And maybe this affects Ashley and some of the things she does. Could you explain about the um, the Chanel case and about disclaimers? Um, yeah. So um, 
one of the things that with trademark law that seems self-apparent is if the whole point of trademark law is to prevent consumer confusion, a great deal of consumer confusion can just be solved by putting a disclaimer on what you what you say so or what you do. So if I uh, have, a, for example, a fan site uh, for something and I say uh, this site is not affiliated in any way with so and so. Um, but that should eliminate consumer confusion. And and uh, courts have recognized that in at least some circumstances, uh, that sort of thing does eliminate opportunities for consumer confusion. But uh, that's not the universal view of all courts. And in fact, there are some courts that say disclaimers don't really do anything because uh, if you, because people don't read carefully. Right. And people might just see this disclaimer and say, like, oh, I see the the name uh, Conan Doyle Estate Limited there. This must be associated with them. Or people don't notice the disclaimer. And so uh, while some courts respect and appreciate disclaimers and would certainly do so with things like books, uh, they're less likely to do so in circumstances where the disclaimer is less obvious uh, and that would have be true for films and uh, plays and things where you kind of you can't have the disclaimer running on the bottom the whole time, um, and also other kinds of products uh, where the disclaimer wouldn't follow the product around. So um, disclaimers potentially uh, really useful, but also disrespected by many courts. Does that Excellent. did that answer what you were, wanted me to answer, Les? Yes, right. I was going to say, I saw there was an example of this. Um, someone put out a book that was the Harry, what, what are the names? I don't, I'm not a Potter fan. The James, uh, James Potter, and his father and his mother. It was a book about the adventures of them when they were young. And it had a disclaimer that said, you know, these characters shouldn't be confused with the characters created by uh, J.K. Rowling. And uh, nonetheless, the book only lasted on Amazon for a few weeks. Uh, right. And uh, let's say forces, economic forces, perhaps, caused it to be withdrawn. But and it certainly the work, I've, the, the work I've done related to Harry Potter, specifically against, against Warner Brothers related to Harry Potter, um, uh, disclaimers have uh, not helped. Stick with us. We'll be back after this brief word from our sponsor. Arthur Conan Doyle wrote 22 novels. The one he thought his best is an adventure story of knights and chivalry. 20-year-old Alan Edrickson travels the world encountering bullies, con artists, thieves, a damsel in distress, and two men who become his closest friends. Together they join the White Company, archers and fighters led by the gallant Sir Nigel Loring. Will our hero win the hand of Loring's romantic daughter Maud? Will the chivalrous Prince Edward restore Peter of Castile to his Spanish throne? Published in 1891 and never out of print, The White Company is a tale of pageantry and piracy, heraldry and hope, published now in an exclusive, annotated edition with the original N.C. Wyeth illustrations in blazing color. Don't you owe it to yourself to read Conan Doyle's favorite book? Get the annotated White Company at wessexpress.com. So, um, Ashley, you've been so patient. I, I thank you for that. Um, I want to. I want to get your opinion on some of this. From a, this is really from more of a creative perspective because uh, you did your study, your your PhD in adaptation studies. So first of all, you want to give us a refresh on that, and then maybe talk a little bit about what the portent of all of the Sherlock Holmes stories being in public domain means for creators. Sure. Uh, this is you know I'm the 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 creative uh, cream in this legal Oreo, I guess. Um, my, my background uh, is on, 
you know, the, the creative product, but particularly on the process of adaptation and specifically on the tracing the evolution of the character of Sherlock Holmes. So how different kind of cultural, creative, economic uh, pressures alter the character in all sorts of ways. That is that it becomes this kind of diffuse mythos, which it is at this point. So the idea that you could claim that there are these, you know, dozen identifiable qualities that if you use them, you are violating the the copyright, which of course isn't going to matter anymore anyway. Um, you know, I would argue that that already becomes problematic because the question of is which Sherlock Holmes are you looking at? And of course the, if you are, you know, looking at BBC Sherlock, that's still in copyright because it's a, it's a unique character. Um, but if you're just creating a Sherlock Holmes, it's just a new one in this huge kind of uh, m massive web of uh, sort of vaguely Sherlockian qualities. In terms of what I think it's going to, to pretend for the creative uh, process, uh, I would say that it probably will have little effect on the very top tier or um, high budget creatives, the people like Warner Brothers who are just going to pay anyway because it's such a small fraction of, of, of the issue for them. You know, in terms of the money, if they have a $150 million budget, they're just going to pay anyway. And so it never really affected them in the first place. And the very low tier, right, people who are publishing non-commercial fan fiction who aren't worried about it in the first place because they're not making a commercial product in the first place. You know, I remember 20 years ago publishing fan fiction, you put a disclaimer at the top going, please don't sue me. I'm 18 and I don't, you know, uh, I don't make any money off of this. And probably that had no effect legally whatsoever, uh, but you did it and it made you feel better. It's the middle tier of creatives, the people who actually have an ambition to make a commercial product, but not a great deal of capital to create that product that would be put off by the idea of litigation. Those people who couldn't afford the $5,000, right? Uh, to, to, to just pay off what the, the estate's extortion rate for whatever their product is. Those people who um, may not create in the first place because they're afraid of it. Those people may be opened up now because they're not going to be looking at the focus details of, well, do they does, does the estate still hold a trademark on the name? What they're going to see is the stories are out of copyright and it's going to open them up from a kind of fear, right, of production. And so I think what we'll see is more creation of low budget commercial products. That would be my instinct. And I think also the that freedom is also going to um, s allow people to feel like they can maybe even push more boundaries in terms of what the character in the world looks like because they don't feel like there's a controlling influence. Whether that control is, is actual or theoretical, even before the stories go out of copyright, is kind of immaterial to them. If they feel that that authority, that control is no longer there, they may open up and create a, a wider range of, of low-budget commercial adaptations. So uh, I, I would imagine, I mean, look, over, over the years, we've seen uh, just a flurry of uh, Sherlockian adaptations. And, and look, it goes all the way back to Conan Doyle's time. I mean, this is not a new phenomenon. And, and Betsy, I think on the last time you were with us on that special free Sherlock episode, we talked about that famous um, response that Conan Doyle sent to Gillette, who asked if he could marry Holmes. And uh, Conan Doyle famously said, well, you can marry him, murder him, do whatever you like with him. Um, and, and you were very clear in that episode that, that this was a uh, Conan Doyle was simply releasing the creative shackles. This was by it, 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 he certainly still had a legal uh, arrangement with Gillette and a financial arrangement with Gillette if there uh, was such a thing then. But that that case uh, eventually landed in court as well, not just for the creative elements, but really just for the naming elements as two film companies went after each other in the uh, late 19-teens, early 1920s, I believe it was. Uh, 1903 was the first one. 
Okay. Uh, so we got a long history of Sherlock Holmes and uh, and and legal uh, claims and creative claims and all the rest. So, um, and and back to you, Ashley. I mean, we've seen you know so many pastiches, so much fan fiction over the years. And one of our uh, Patreon supporters asked, uh, th- "Does does this mean that it'll lead to even more?" Sherlock Holmes film, TV, and stage productions. You, you mentioned kind of that middle tier, but do we think we'll see more high quality stuff or that it's really just going to be flooded? I think it's going to be more about quantity than quality. Not to say if you increase the quantity, you're going to end up with more pieces of quality within there, right? Um, but I would say people like YouTubers and fan artists, people who have the ability to, um, you know, in our, our, uh, very diffuse media model that we have now where, uh, people have the means to create something that is much higher quality than somebody who, who didn't have, um, who doesn't have commercial production resources could create five, 10, 15 years ago, right? People can create things that are, of an incredible quality without all that much uh, financial outlay. I think that tier of people has the ability to create a lot of really interesting, high quality stuff. Is there also going to be a, a flood of other stuff? Um, sure. I'll give you kind of an example, um, which is uh, in our private chat, Les asked um, what the outcome of this might be for Ken in particular. You know, I, I run Ken Ludwig's company. Ken has done several Sherlock Holmes plays. Um, and the one that people probably are most familiar with is his uh, adaptation of The Hound of the Baskervilles, right? It's called Baskerville. Um, now, by the time Ken wrote that play, Hound of the Baskerville was not under copyright. He didn't have to pay the estate to, to do that play. But he now has that as a a licensable creative product, which is when a theater wants to put on his production, his Hound of the Baskervilles, they have to pay Samuel French to license his play to put it on so that that's how a playwright makes royalties, right? Well, the Hound of the Baskervilles being out of copyright means actually if a theater looks at that and goes, well, I don't want to pay, you know, X amount of dollars to license this play, people recognize the title, the Hound of the Baskervilles, I'll just write my own. And I, in fact, saw a theater do that. I went to a, a production in a theater that is, um, it's it's a theater that has a, a repertory company, which means it's it's a theater that, you know, is not a nonprofit. It's not a community theater. Um, but they, uh, they decided rather than licensing Ken's Hound of the Baskervilles or any of the other Sherlock Holmes plays that can be licensed, there are several, um, they would just put on the Hound of the Baskervilles. And the first thing I noticed when I look at the playbill was there's no adapted by, there's no playwright's name on it. And the reason was that the people at the theater read the story and just put it on stage themselves. So they didn't have to pay any licensing fees. Well, that means two things. One, Ken doesn't make any money on his play. And two, there's a second Hound of the Baskervilles that was really bad. The play was really, really painful to watch because the people who did it were not playwrights and they didn't they didn't adapt the texts well. And so it was just people standing on stage saying the lines at each other. Uh, there was no, it was not dynamic in any way. And so the the product was poor. Um, and what this means is not just for the Hound of the Baskervilles, but for the entire idea, right? Again, it's that it's that theoretical pressure. Well, if it's all in the public public domain, I can do any Sherlock Holmes thing I want. You're going to have, uh, yes, there's going to be a glut <laughs> of of uh, badly written, uh, badly adapted Sherlock Holmes text. We should all prepare for that. And in fairness, we've all read rotten pastiches up to this point. Too. So, you know, nothing really new there other than a lot more people are going to be doing them, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to mention here touches on this subject, and it has to do with the origins of the Conan Doyle estate. You know, we should point out that originally there was um, 
quite a groundswell of feeling that Dame Jean Conan Doyle, who was Sir Arthur's last surviving child, needed to have her rights protected in the United States. And so when people would take material that was then under copyright and publish it, um, there was a group of people who were interested in ensuring that, that she received the remuneration for that, for her father's work. But that also touches on this element of trust and management of the property. And it sounds to me as if um, this is now more the responsibility of a community of people who um, feel a deep kinship with the character than it is through any avenue of the courts and so on. But the other side of that, you know, and we've talked about this in terms of trademark and adaptation. Um, I gather that the current state of, of the play here in, in 2023 is that if I want to introduce a line of neckties called Sherlock Holmes brand neckties, I probably can't do that as long as somebody else has staked out a claim in that particular category. But that if I wanted to do, let's say, Ashley Polisek's Sherlock Holmes the Musical, I could happily get my orchestra and get my composer and get my typewriter and get busy and produce Ashley Polisek's Sherlock Holmes the Musical. Is that about right? Let Betsy so, answer the first half of that, and I'll come to the second half. <laughs> yeah. So the the uh, I'll, I'll I'll touch on the second half as well, but um, the the first half uh, you're in trouble with neckties because they've registered for apparel. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, specifically they've registered for apparel. Of course um, they did. <laughs> but. Yeah. Um, as to the second, um, you you are not entirely out of the woods, uh, but you're in much safer ground. Um, trademarks are uh, trademarks are sort of complicated beasts uh, in that they um, they exist without with and without registrations. Uh, so, uh, it's, the registration is like a birth certificate. You can have a baby without having a birth certificate. Likewise, you can have a trademark without having a, how, having a registration. And, um, there's no shortage of claims by former copyright holders that they own unregistered trademarks. Um, the Burroughs estate did a lot of that with Tarzan and, uh, and things like that. Uh, so they can say we have a trademark, even though it's not registered, um, there's also a, a host of, and Ashley can talk more to that. This, um, uh, there's a because there's a host of adaptations out there. Uh, there's a minefield that when you do your adaptation, you have to make sure that you're not uh, coming. Um, you're, you're not coming into um, uh, you know what somebody else did. So. Uh, Right. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, talk about Sherlock Holmes's cocaine use, you may well run into problems with copyright of seven percent solution. If you want to talk about uh, Sherlock Holmes's, uh, you know, various other things like that, you may run into problems with, uh, you know, if you want to talk about Sherlock Holmes as, as a as a boxer, a, a martial arts master, you might run into problems with um, with Warner Brothers, that sort of thing. But uh, generally speaking, the there's at least one less player on the minefield. Yeah, and I will say that there was a there was a clear case um, where that came up, which is when uh, the CBS wanted to do Elementary, and BBC already had a contemporized 21st century Sherlock Holmes character. And there was gonna there was a question about whether that was an infringement on the BBC's intellectual property because the of these this modernized or contemporized Sherlock Holmes was their their idea. Um, ultimately, I don't actually know if any suits were brought. I know that there were conversations between the BBC people and the CBS people. I know that their teams had conversations. I think ultimately it was not litigated, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, it's worth somebody else who knows more about that. Uh, no law lawsuit, it was agreed on. Great, thank you, Betsy. Um, so, you know, 
that is that is an, an issue, right? It's an issue that there's any time a new work is created, the copyright is created in the new work and the adaptation then is its own intellectual property and you have to tread carefully. Um, if you can trace something back to the canon, you know, I think that's probably the, the way to go, right? Oh, well, cocaine use is in the canon. So it's not 7% solution, it's the canon and we're both working on this uh, out of copyright um, text. Same thing with martial arts. Well, he's mentioned as a martial artist in the canon, right? He, he boxes and, and does single sticks. So you can, you can use that probably, or at least you can make that argument. It doesn't mean that they're not going to come after you, right? It just means that you c might be able to make a, make a case for it. So uh, we've got a uh, comment from Joe Fay here. Um, it's up on the screen now. Uh, he says, and, and Betsy, I'm guessing this is one for you. He says, how can they claim, for example, a protected trademark uh, for the image of Holmes and a deer stalker since it wasn't part of the original stories? Hey, Betsy, to unmute. I'm unmuted. Um, there you go. So the, the, the answer is, they probably shouldn't be able to, uh, but here's how here's how it works. Uh, it, the because trademarks are sort of witchcraft. Um, the question is not who created the trademark. That's the question with copyright. But the question we ask is who authored this, and the and copyright first instantiates in an author. Um, uh, in, in our internal chat, there's a question about our translations separately copyrighted. And the answer is yes, translations are separately copyrighted, but only the parts that the translator added or what the translator contributed the same way that um, right, the, the, the minefield uh, of copyright is more complicated. So copyright cares very much who created what. Trademark doesn't. The only thing that trademark cares about is what the reasonable consumer is likely to assume. And the reasonable consumer is stupid. <laughs> um, so uh, the reasonable consumer may not know that and you don't even have to be stupid not to know that the the image of the calabash pipe and the deer stalker was Gillette rather than um, than uh, Conan Doyle estate uh, or Conan Doyle's ca canonical works. Um, but if a reasonable consumer would see that silhouette and assume that it was associated with the uh, with the original story owner, that's how how they would get that trademark. Um, to be clear, I don't know that they do. In fact, I think it's it's extremely unlikely that they uh, that that uh, the Conan Doyle estate. Uh, or anybody else would own that uh, that connection between the Sherlock Holmes silhouette and any class of goods, um, except you know very specific. Like if I make a pin, then maybe yes, I have trademark for that pin kind of thing. Um, but uh, it, we have to look to the reasonable consumer. That's fair. That's fair. And and as we know, the public is, well, the great unobservant public, as Holmes himself uh, said. So um, uh, I, I, we've been here for an hour or so, and this is such a rich topic. I mean, I know you're all passionate about it, but um, I, I want to throw this up as kind of a kind of a jump ball, if I may. Um, as we think about our hobby, uh, the things we enjoy, the reasons we come together. I mean, certainly it is all around the original stories. It's about uh, the many adaptations over the course of the years. Um, do we think that Sherlock Holmes in the public domain is going to do us as hobbyists, as devotees, as fans, uh, more harm or more good? Jump all ball. Good. Go for it. All good all the time. Everything, yeah, it's all, it's all good. Um, as long as we are not, as a group, tempted to uh, use it as an opportunity to become gatekeepers ourselves and go, well, it's not, a, it's in the public domain. So now we have to make sure that we don't let the garbage in. Um, let all the garbage in. It'll sort itself out. Let everybody do what they want. 
don't don't police the new creative works that are coming out other than either pay for them or don't. Um, every, everything else, let it let it work. That's that would be my only my only negative is that our our instinct to gatekeep uh, needs to be kept in check. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very valid one, Ashley. And it seems like there are certain individuals in our hobby over the many, many decades who have taken it upon themselves to be the arbiters of what is acceptable and what is not. And look, everyone has different tastes. And we here and I hear of Sherlock everywhere believe that all Sherlock is good Sherlock. And uh, whatever brings people together for the celebration of this wonderful character that was given to us uh, over uh, 100 and, oh, 130 years ago uh, is, is a good thing, right? So, you know, creatively, you may not agree with certain decisions, but uh, uh, culturally, uh, artistically, community-wise, I think there's, uh, there's great value in a lot of that. Nobody's making you read it. Nobody's making you watch it. Right. You can just go about your business. If you want Sherlock Holmes to be a certain way, write it yourself. That's what you get to do now. By all means, make it make what you want to exist exist, uh, and let it be a part of the the public discussion. That's all. Let people enjoy things. There you go. Great. Yeah, my point is our role is curatorial, not proprietary. We can we can we can recommend things. We should recommend things. But that's the most we can and should do. Well, and I think the, the wonderful thing about so many of us being a part of this uh, community is uh, just like the Baker Street Irregulars in the original stories, they were Holmes' eyes and ears. We can't possibly know everything that's going on in the world of Sherlock Holmes. Um, quite frankly, I don't know if I want to. I think my, my brain would explode. And, and even though I hear of Sherlock everywhere is supposed to be monitoring all of this, we gave up on that a long time ago because it's, that's a full-time job. And the pay sucks, quite frankly. So, uh, and and I'm blaming Bert for that because High he, time. Just, he abolished my pension. I mean, it's just it's horrible the way this organization has just gone t- into the crapper. Healthcare um, healthcare costs were killing us. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. Uh, be, because you've been uh, prescribing brandy for everything, uh, Bert. That's right. I mean, it's gonna it's just gonna kill everyone here. Well, I think we should thank our guests and thank our viewers for um, kicking us off and getting us close to the new year, which will be very exciting for the world of Sherlock Holmes. And I will note that uh, just I, I didn't see the private chat here, but uh, Les did claim one exception to what's <laughs> acceptable. Uh, he said, except Will Ferrell. <laughs> so, no, I think many Les, of us can agree on that. You have to let it all be. I know, I know. <laughs> Sad as it is. All right. Well, uh, any any final uh, words of wisdom? Uh, Les, Betsy, Ashley, I mean, you've just been great guests here. No words of wisdom. Okay. That, well, you gave us all your words of wisdom throughout all. the show. That's good. Well, uh, thank you one and all for uh, being with us here today. And, uh, you know, we've just had a wonderful um, a chat and, and commentary coming in from our uh, viewers and listeners as they've gone along here. So Christine and Ed and Joe, Mark, Madeline, Kelly, um, Eric. I mean, you, you've just been fantastic. You've asked some great questions. We've been putting them up here on the screen. Uh, and we have uh, mentioned some of them auto, audio, audibly, right? So people who hear the audio version of our show will be able to partake of those as well. And uh, we'll have much more, uh, I'm sure, into the future. In the meantime... Uh, We'll be seeing every one of you, dear panelists, in New York for the BSI weekend in a scant few days. All right. Well, um, and thank you very much, one and all. Uh, Any any final words of wisdom from you, Bert? (laughs) Yes, I have a few slides prepared. So if you turn to the sixth, no. (laughs) Happy New Year and happy Sherlocking. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I guess with that, we will uh, we will play ourselves out here and uh, we'll see everyone on the other side. Well, I have to say, um, 
that was <laughs> an unexpected delight. I mean, yes, we talked with Betsy and Les nine years ago, ostensibly about the same topic, but boy, how so much has changed since then and how it, uh, it colors our view of the future now. And to have Ashley with us as well to talk through uh, her perspective from, uh, you know, a creator, from somebody who's seen uh, how different adaptations take form. I mean, it just, it gives us so much to think about, so much to hope for, I think, for the mm -hmm. Sherlockian future. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the creative toolkit around adapting homes and extending homes the universe of Sherlock Holmes is just limitless. There just don't seem to be any boundaries at all. But it'll be interesting. I don't have a sense, a terror, a great sense, thanks to the work that Laurie King and Les did, uh, uh, you know, and Betsy and others already, on clarifying and and um, rationalizing the treatment of Sherlock Holmes in the public sphere. I don't have the sense that. We've been that we've been terribly constrained up to now. <laughs> so, um, well, I what wonder... about that? What about that long-standing Langdale Pike story you've been longing to write? <clears throat> oh yeah, that Langdale. Now I can finally get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't touch that with a Langdale Pike. <laughs> I wouldn't touch that with a ten-foot Langdale. No, <laughs> no. But you know, it's. I just. Be, it's going to be really interesting. You know, I think you're right about how much has changed. Um, I wonder, I just, I can't imagine what it's going to be like looking back, you know, five or 10 years from now and saying, um, boy, look what's happened since Holmes has been in the public domain. Yeah. Completely. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that, but you know, I think, uh, market tastes will prevail. You know, we, as we were talking there, there was, uh, I don't remember if we if it was mentioned in the conversation or if it was just one of the um, pop-ups on the chat that we saw. But someone said, you know, our role is not judgmental, it's curatorial. Yeah. And even if a whole bunch of crap gets produced, <laughs> um, well, people's tastes and, and the market demand or lack of market demand will uh, help indicate what more needs to be written of what type. Mm, that's true. That's why, well, and I think it's already worked that way, you know, over the last century. I mean, there's been, <laughs> there's been no shortage of, of um, questionable and poor ideas. Associated. You can say, you can say craptacular. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that I go quite that far. <laughs> But, um, you know, there's been no shortage of those things. And um, happily, you know, you're right. Public taste and time, things endure and things don't endure. Well, and But it's all a lot of fun. It, well, of course it is. And that's why we, it, it keeps happening. I mean, look, it, particularly in these days, and, and really it's not that much different from when the Sherlockian movement started out. Um, anyone can produce a piece of art. I know, written, visual, audio, etc., cetera, um, for a niche audience. And indeed, that's exactly what Sherlockians have been doing. I mean, you try and go and, you know, find an old pamphlet of um, Edgar Smith or Vincent Starrett. Mm. Um, you know, they limited the runs to, you know, 100 copies, uh, maybe even 500 copies in some cases, but they knew there was a limited audience for it. Mm. And uh, as long as those people to whom you are trying to reach, are fervent about it and are just as excited as you are, I think there will continue to be uh, a bunch of opportunities like this for content of all types. There's always something new at the MX Publishing website. And if you haven't been to their site since December rolled around, well, you might be missing a few things. There were dozens of books that MX Publishing published in 2022. And in the month of December alone uh, were two new titles. The Torso at Highgate Cemetery and Other Sherlock Holmes Stories by Tim Simons debuted. 
It involves things like the mystery of the missing artifacts from August 1916, the case of the 17th monk, the strange death of an art dealer, the case of the Impressionist painting, and more by Tim Simons. And there's also The New Sherlockian by Kelvin I. Jones, the magazine that the indefatigable Holmesian Kelvin Jones edited in the mid-1980s for publication by Magico Magazine, has been republished in one volume. Got essays and stories by leading Sherlockians from the UK, US, and Canada. You can delight in offerings by people like Michael Hardwick, David Stewart Davies, Catherine Cook, Michael Keane, and Roger Johnson, the present editor of the Sherlock Holmes Journal. Check that out on MX Publishing, as well as Tim Simon's The Torso at Highgate Cemetery and other Sherlock Holmes stories. There's always something new at MX Publishing at mxpublishing.com. Okay, that's it, that's it. It's the last <laughs> quiz of season 16. That's right, it's the final canonical couplet in our series of couplets here. This this must be our, what, 20, 24th couplet of the year? Uh, I've, I've lost track at this point. <laughs> um, but, you know, we all have a good time around here. Thanks, as we learned along the way this season, in part to Bert's handicraft with <laughs> coupleting. So the last time we were here, uh, you'll recall we gave you this clue. Watson now has surgeon's eyes when he's so inclined. It only takes his glance to see a weakness in the spine. Bert. Mm. <laughs> uh, here it comes. Uh, which canonical story is this quote from or is this we, is this couplet from we need fewer couplets and more decoupling i think yeah. but no this is this is easy this is the story about the eccentric american bedspread designer who supposedly left money to relatives that's the story watson called the three garish beds <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I uh, like that the crickets. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket. It's oh. it's because our listeners have a conscience. That's, <laughs> really. Can anyone whistle? That's what I want. Uh no. No, unfortunately. <laughs> oh. Uh that is not what we we're looking for. I mean, you were so close, but what we were looking for in this case was uh the Sussex Vampire. Ooh. The Sussex Vampire. I know it's difficult to uh, recall those at will all the time. So let's do this. Let's uh, bring in the big prize wheel and give it a spin. Goes round and round. Landing on number 22. 22. And it looks like that goes to Edward Lear. Ed, uh, congratulations. Uh, what do we have for you from episode two? Oh, yes, we have a copy of uh, Lisa Sherwood Fabre's latest in her Life and Times of Sherlock Holmes series there. We'll have a copy of that off to you, Ed, and uh, you can enjoy it. Uh, so what are we going to do for a, a, a prize this time? I think we will free some of the Sherlock in our vaults this time around uh, keeping with the theme here and we'll we'll give that to the winner who answers this clue the second class carriage from the front has been reserved watson's luggage gets to paris well before him he observed if you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email address to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are correct and we choose you at random from all the correct answers, you'll win our prize. Good luck. Phew. Woo. Unbelievable. Fabulous. I know. Season 16 wraps now. 
Off to season 17. What do you think we have in store for season 17? Season 17. Well, undoubtedly, you know, more Sherlock Holmes, more books, more stories, more <laughs> plays, more audio. Virtual yeah. reality. I'll bet that I'll bet that we get a meta program out of the next 12 months. Um I'm not going to hang my deer stalker on that, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, however, I will say with almost certainty, there will be plenty of Sherlock Holmes books for us to power through. Um, I'm, I'm sure with the BSI weekend coming up in a scant few days that we will pick up a treasure trove of newly published books from mm. the likes of the BSI Press, Wessex Press, etc. And mm. we'll talk to them. We'll be talking to uh, some of the folks from MX Publishing, one of our sponsors here. Uh, I know they have a number of authors and creators lined up. It'll be nice to speak to some of them. And, um, well, you know, it, it, it's a multimedia world. So film, television, audio, uh, comics, graphic novels, um, you name it. This is, this is why we are, I hear of Sherlock, everywhere. Everywhere. You know, it's a good thing we didn't name the uh, the show I Hear of Sherlock Only in Certain Places. <laughs> well, I like my idea for a title. I Hear of Sherlock Over There Just a Little Bit in the Corner. <laughs> I thought that it was a nice acronym, but hard to pronounce. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm thinking now, for our first episode of Season 17, I should go back and see if I can find my notes from... Gosh, it must have been the spring or summer of 2007 when we were concepting this show and seeing if I still have the notes of uh, alternative, uh, alternative show titles that um, I had written down. Hmm. I don't know if those exist in the IHO's archives. They may oh. be at the Lilly Library at this point. Well, I doubt that. Seriously, <laughs> I don't think they want any of that. Um, I'll, I'll, what I'll do, I'll dust the, the I'll dust off the, the belongings in our uh, our IHO's vaults and see if uh, the notes are in there. It'll be interesting if we can do a little bit of a retrospective before we kick in. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Well, and uh, quite frankly, uh, folks, if you uh, are eager to hear about any particular subject. Uh, or know of any particular topic that needs our attention, uh, we welcome your input. Simply drop us a line at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. We're always happy to hear from you for any reason. And, of course, we remind you that our Patreon support continues to roll on into 2023. We have thank you gifts there for you, so check that out. And if you wouldn't mind leaving us a rating on iTunes, um, you don't even have to review us. Just dro drop us in a rating the star of your choice. Um, and let's hope it's not Aurora Borealis. Wait, that's not a star, is it? <laughs> I'm thinking of Orion. Well, that's not a star either. No, that's a constellation. <clears throat> yes. I, I'm going to have a supernova here in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving from the supernova to the black hole of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. <laughs> Uh, I guess that's the appropriate time for us to admit that this is the starry-eyed Scott Monty. And I'm just a lot of interstellar dust. I'm Burt Walder. And together, we say... The, the Games, games of Foot! <laughs> the, the Games of Foot! <laughs> I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.